So uh, thank you for watching. Um, it's Saturday, March 21st, and um, I'm talking to you live from our headquarters here in northern Colorado, um, where the NEGR office is. And um, of course, it's a Saturday, and so there aren't many people in the office, but many of us are working, as we have been working all week. And uh, uh, if you're a donor, we want to thank you for supporting us and supporting the families and the staff uh, who, who work here in this office. And um, I know they're appreciative of, of your of your support. And uh, I can tell you as their boss that we have a great group of, of uh, very passionate defenders of liberty here. And um, um, I'm routinely humbled by how willing they are to do, go the extra mile and come in on Saturdays and fly around the country and do things that frankly are not always comfortable um, and learn new things and basically stand up for freedom in your stead. We know that you don't have the time to fly around the country fighting against politicians who are screwing with your gun rights, and um, um, that's really why we exist. Uh, I also know that these people, um, like everybody in America, are concerned about not only maybe a little bit about the virus, but certainly a lot about the panic that seems to be pervasive um, in our society. And, um, uh, and you know, but they're still um, working. So with that, um, let me tell you what we're going to cover here today and um, should be about 30 minutes. Uh, I know we're going to cover, um, first off, uh, a federal restriction on on um, some of these gun control efforts. And, and this is really a reminder for politicians and um, elected officials and law enforcement officers that there are some restrictions on on their ability, even in times of an emergency, to uh, um, to restrict citizens' right to keep and bear arms, and then we're going to talk uh, about really state legislatures and the states themselves, and what has been happening over the last you know two weeks, um, and of course many of those state legislatures were in session up until uh, recently, and uh, and a lot of them went out of session. And um, in one ways, that's good. But in other ways, obviously, it was due to this um, virus. And so um, we're going to talk about what that means. So what I'd like to do is bring on NHGR's Vice President, Ryan Flugar. And, and there's Ryan. He's at his home office today in, uh, in northern Colorado again. And um, Ryan, I'm glad to have you here. Let's go do a good audio check. Testing, testing. Can you hear me, Dudley? Works great. Um, Excellent. And uh, uh, Ryan, Ryan really oversees all, a lot of our political uh, programs, and um, both on a federal and state and local levels, and um, and is really my right hand man for this. And Ryan, I'd love to to hear um, about an amendment that was that was passed in more than a decade ago that's very applicable right now. So yes, Dudley. So first and foremost, uh, during a state of emergency, uh, the Second Amendment does apply. So for the local officials who think that they can get around that, um, no, sorry, you can't. Um, but um, on top of that, uh, back in 2006, you may remember in the wake of Hurricane Katrina, when uh, uh, the mayor of New Orleans, Ray Nagin, ordered uh, firearms to be confiscated from citizens just willy-nilly, um, there is a big blowback to that uh, nationally and, uh, and in Congress. Um, as a result, Congress passed what's known as the Vitter Amendment. Um, it's a federal law today, and it basically says that um, there will be no gun confiscation during a state of emergency. Federal officials are prohibited from confiscating firearms during a state of emergency, and any state official or local entity that takes money from the federal government is also prohibited from doing that. So um, that's good news for gun owners. We've been getting tons of questions of, from folks wondering, uh, are my gun rights safe during a state of emergency? And at least from uh, gun confiscation uh, outside of uh, normal law enforcement activities, uh, yes, they are safe. But um, what it doesn't cover, uh, it doesn't cover the transportation of firearms or the sale of firearms. And that's where we're seeing a whole bunch of stuff uh, fire up in places like New Orleans again and 
uh, Champlain, Illinois, and um, in San Jose, California, where uh, local governments are trying to uh, restrict that. Well, again, the Second Amendment still applies, uh, but states vary wildly. Um, on the state level, um, uh, 29 states right now have some form of an emergency uh, uh, law governing uh, the protection of firearms in the state of emergency. They do vary wildly, though. Some of them mirror the federal law that just covers the um, confiscation of firearms, says no confiscation during a state of emergency, but other places like Virginia actually do go further and uh, protect in state statute so far um, uh, the uh, sale and transportation of firearms as well. So my advice, check your state, uh, keep an eye on the news. Um, first and foremost, don't panic about any of this yet um, because um, you know, there is a, a federal law that protects your right to care, uh, to uh, uh, have a firearm right now. It's the Second Amendment. Ryan, um, I was, uh, uh, of course, I've been a gun lobbyist now for 26 years, and, and I was representing gun owners during the Katrina crisis here in Colorado, though, and paying attention, however, during Katrina. And, um, and so that was this big reaction to Katrina was, Hey, mm -hmm. wait a minute, we got to put some kind of restrictions. And it was largely, you know, born out of the fact they were going door to door confiscating people's firearms. Well, it, it seems odd that you would have to tell people that's like the time when most people really want a firearm for self-defense. You know, if law enforcement is taxed and, mm -hmm. and, and they're really busy because they're dealing with medical emergencies and they're dealing with who, who knows what else, um, who's going to protect your family at, at those crucial times when, let's say, looters or a burglar comes in or somebody comes in, uh, you know, to steal your food or something to that effect? Well, guess what? Um, that's when you need a firearm. And, uh, and, and that was definitely true in Katrina. And, um, and of course, they confiscated them. That, there was a very big reaction. Even kind of left-wing people understood that, uh, that that was maybe not a good move. I'm pretty sure that was embarrassing. Um, but, but that's a good reminder. And um, we're going to post this up on our website, this Vitter Amendment and our, and our uh, um, let's call it our uh, uh, fact sheet on the Vitter Amendment for our members to look at. Wouldn't be bad to print them out. Um, wouldn't be bad to um, even take one down to your police station and, uh, and make sure they have a copy because <laughs> there aren't many, uh, police departments that don't in some manner or another receive federal funds. And in fact, many of the larger ones use, uh, federal equipment. So former military equipment. So, mm -hmm. um, let's bring in, um, uh, Brendan Boudreau is our director of, of field operations and Brendan's uh, works remotely on a normal basis. He's he said this is normal for me in many ways. <laughs> He's in uh, in Michigan and um, and Brendan, you oversee our our field team, our guys and gals who are all around the country, um, monitoring and working on state legislatures. And clearly, this is a time to pay attention to state level government as well. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And a, and a lot has changed in the last. I, week and a half, two weeks where there were a, uh, obviously at the beginning of every year, you have all the state legislatures, uh, most of them anyways, you had a, a handful who didn't have sessions this year, but you're talking about 40 some states going into session this year, um, taking up matters of budgets and legislation. And then all of a sudden that came to a screeching halt. Uh, we were working on projects to pass constitutional carry laws in Alabama, Tennessee, uh, to name a few uh, of the states that we're operating in where legislatures just packed up shop, they passed their budgets, passed some additional spending for response to the coronavirus and have adjourned. Um, you know, and, and they're basically uh, <clears throat> closing up shop for either for the year or, uh, or uh, just for a few weeks to see what happens. Uh, I, I live here in Michigan and uh, we have a full-time legislature here and they are out of session until next week, but they could just go back there gavel in for a, for a couple minutes and then be done again. Um, you know, states going out of session uh, in a couple instances has actually helped us. Um, Maine, uh, the Democrats control everything up there. 
Um, they were flirting with passing a mandatory storage law uh, that uh, thankfully by by them going out of session uh, killed killed that uh, killed that effort. So, you know, it's not all bad. Um, you know, certainly our efforts to pass constitutional carry in Tennessee and Alabama probably are are taking a back seat uh, given the current situation. But, you know, really, Dudley, if I may, talking about constitutional carry, um, this is a time when constitutional carry is, is so necessary. Government control over the right to keep and bear arms, carrying a pistol for self-defense is a problem. Uh, the 15 states we consider that. Wait, 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 let's hold on, hold on, Brandon, before yeah, we go sure. too far, because we've yeah. got a lot of new people um, interested in in um, what the laws are who might yeah. not in the past have even known or or paid any attention to this, might have even opposed uh, um, repeal of restrictions, and, and suddenly now they're, you know, they're foxhole converts. Um, yeah. But it, if they don't know what constitutional carry is, why don't you tell yeah. them? Yeah, exactly. So constitutional carry is a simple idea that if you can legally possess a pistol, you should be able to carry it openly or concealed without having to get a government permit. That's the way 15 states do it currently. Um, you know, most recently, South Dakota, Kentucky, and Oklahoma passed these laws in 2019. Uh, you know, it just it recognizes that as as Americans, as uh, as citizens, we have a right to keep and bear arms, and uh, the government should not require the pay the payment of, of a tax. Uh, or the passing of, of stringent background checks, fingerprints being added to a, a government database, um, then having to renew it every five years and pay the expense over and over again just to practice this right. Um, that's what National Association for Gun Rights believes, and we're leading this charge to pass constitutional carry across the country, and we've, we've by the grace of God, we've been successful in doing it. Um, and it's, it's in moments like this where you have states that you know, local governments are shutting down. You have police departments across the country that are saying, we're not running fingerprints. Here in Michigan, we have several counties that are saying, we're not doing fingerprints for, for uh, concealed pistol licenses. So that means that if you want to carry concealed in Michigan, you don't have the ability to go and comply with the law now. And in Michigan, if you carry concealed or in a car without a permit, it's a five-year felony. I mean, that's, that's, not, that's not a joke um, to be thrown in jail for five years for a victimless crime. But, Let me well hold on for a sec. Let me ask yeah. uh, my guys in the studio if you could pull my uh, Facebook comments up. I for some reason I can't see them. Yeah, just stand by. Um, and so um, I want to I want to like drill in on this. And why don't we bring Ryan up there as well because he, <laughs> he might have some some commentary. Um, uh, yes, every state is different, and there are a lot of different laws. Yesterday I was talking to. <laughs> Our, our our group members in Colorado at Rocky Mountain Gun Owners and on video just like this and and in, in Colorado you don't need a concealed handgun permit to carry in a car and you don't need a concealed handgun permit it doesn't even apply in your car it doesn't apply to an AR-15 you could carry an AR-15 in your car concealed and that concealed handgun permit means nothing for for that and um and even though right now we're seeing a lot of people running out to try and apply. And, and I want to tell those people, if you're, you know, it, look at your state level gun laws. In many states, however, you can open carry. In many states, you can carry in your car without restrictions. You don't necessarily need a concealed handgun permit. And of course, the ultimate is, uh, is in, um, uh, in, in states with those 15 states with constitutional carry, you know, you don't need to ask permission. Now, um, in times like this, frankly, uh, a handgun is just a very small item. Uh, I tell, you know, people ask me, why do I carry a handgun, concealed handgun? And I say, easy, to fight my way back to my assault rifle. Um, I don't want to carry a handgun when I can carry a, 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 a magazine-fed rifle. Yeah. Um, <laughs> however, uh, however, um, that, those state laws, we realize they vary differently. Um, broadly by the state. Um, figure out what your state allows first. Yeah. But this is the reason that we try to pass constitutional carrier, one of the many. Yep. This is also the reason why we want to repeal this ridiculous Brady law. When you are when you need a firearm, you need it post haste when you actually do, whether you're being stalked as a, a single mother by, by you know, an ex-boyfriend, um, you know, a 
restraining order or a piece of paper isn't doing you any good. Um, a law that says you can't commit violence against me doesn't really work, does it? Um, the As Colonel Cooper said, the only proper response to unwarranted force is swift, overwhelming counterforce. And that's the only thing criminals understand. Um, and so, so care, a uh, firearm is really the great equalizer. Doesn't matter how big they are, especially to women, doesn't matter how big your assailant is. Um, um, if you're, if you know how to use a firearm, you've been trained and, and you have, and you have one available, it usually stops them. So, um, yeah, that's why we want to change those, those laws and get rid of these ludicrous gun controls. Yeah, Dudley. I mean, one of the reasons you mentioned the Brady law, for those of you who don't know what that is, that's the, uh, that's effectively the background check system, or as we call it, the gun registration system managed by the federal level. Um, there are about a half dozen states that have their own uh, background check systems in Colorado. It's CBI, Colorado Bureau of Investigations. Um, and you know, we're seeing in Colorado delays of up to 40, uh, you know, 44, 72 hours just to get a, uh, a background check approved when purchasing a firearm. We've had reports out of Washington state that uh, the, the, the wait has been up to three weeks in some cases. Other states, I know, Brendan, you said um, uh, the fingerprinting issue in Michigan is causing some delays. Uh, we've seen, we've heard of hiccups in Georgia and Tennessee. Those are two states that are not constitutional carry states, and they're also permitted open carry states. So they have to have a permit to even open carry a firearm. Uh, so these hiccups and delays are, are, are unacceptable right now. And uh, that's why we're urging all states to just go ahead and waive the Brady requirements. And because uh, uh, right delayed is a right denied. That's right. unacceptable. Hey, I didn't say this at the beginning. I, I, I should have. This is a note for our studio. Um, we should always probably have that up on our board. Um, whenever we do these live, we want you to comment and share and like and give us a feedback, a reaction. So um, please, um, you can host a watch party, um, which is one of the buttons you can see there. If you host the watch party, it shares with all your friends. Um, if you could do that right now, that would be helpful. It also uh, shows them later, even after this video is no longer live. So let me address a couple of the comments. Uh, Frank uh, said many sheriff departments in New York State <coughs> stopped all processing on pistol permit applications due to the recent virus. And, and of course, um, again, you're talking about New York. And and yeah, they're, they have pretty ug ugly laws on on firearms, and one of them is you have to have this pistol uh, uh, permit. Um, in some states, you have to have a firearms owner ID card, and uh, of course, government's going to restrict those. And um, and that's the reason not to have those restrictions. Obviously, is that when you really need it, uh, and you had to hurry out and get it, um, you're not going to be able to get it um, in many cases. Now, we're going to do our best to try and force state governments and local governments and sheriffs to follow the law. Um, but, you know, this is this is a tough time to do it. We only have so many staff. So, um, you know, a lot of people put, um, they're in California, I think they use the term California. And, uh, um, and those guys are, you know, agreed, it's tough. Uh, they're in uh, shelter in place orders in the state. And um, um, yeah, it's it's difficult. Uh, I, I think um, yes, Illinois. Uh, uh, John in Illinois said their uh, their laws are ridiculous. I think he's in Illinois. So, um, but some people are in Kentucky. There's a there's a Keith in Eastern Kentucky. Keith, you do, we passed constitutional carry. Here, let me fix this. I'm like, hey, um, you notice what I have behind me. Here is uh, just our little eye candy is a, an MG42 machine gun um, that we mounted up back there just for people to see. Um, Keith is in, in Kentucky where we passed constitutional carry last year. And I was there for the signing with then Governor Matt Bevin. And, and um, um, yeah, you don't have that many problems in, in Kentucky. But I, everybody in America is under one restriction. And that is, if you want to go buy a firearm, you have to wait for government permission. And and why? Because the Brady Act. Um, and that Brady Act 
is the cornerstone for all gun control. And you're seeing it now. In, in, in many states, the wait time right now, because of the backlog of people applying to get buy a firearm, is two days, three days, um, five days. Well, in Colorado here, uh, it's right at three days right now, which 72 hours is the, they actually have to allow the dealer to, to issue you the gun. Um, and um, even if the background check doesn't come back positive or negative, they, they have to, to issue it. In some states, it's different. So um, go ahead. Uh, you guys can jump in. Yeah, I mean to 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 touch up base on uh, touch on further regarding government control of the right to keep and bear arms. I mean, Ryan already talked about this. How several states are just flat out no longer processing concealed handgun permits. Um, Georgia has said that it's a non-essential uh, function of government yeah. to to issue all permits. Uh, I mean, that's 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 pretty bad. Um, yeah. In a very yeah. very red state. Right? Yeah. 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 Um, so, yeah, I mean, you've got states across the country that now have found that uh, this that this is not a, that the right to carry is not as a non-essential function. And when they have the power to control it and deny people through, you know, saying, well, we're not going to do fingerprints anymore. We're not going to do permits. Well, if you can't do it, then you should waive the requirement. Uh, well, that's that's yeah. where you know governors across the state or across the country should be. You know, I mean, they're they're finding all new things to, to waive. Uh, during these during this emergency, waive the requirement to have permits so that people can carry for their self defense and their families without having to worry about getting thrown in jail over it. Well, yeah. and, and Rick says that background checks should take no more than one hour, uh, or you get to bypass that step and purchase your firearm legally. Uh, um, thanks for the comment, Rick. I know you're in you're in Colorado, uh, uh, Rick. You're the problem is. We don't think they should have the right to do that in the first place. Um, show me in the Constitution where it says uh, that they get to restrict our Second Amendment right um, the same way um, they re they restrict uh, you know how we buy how we get a, a some kind of permit to build a house. I mean, why do we have to ask government permission? Well, the mm -hmm. reason is because a deal was cut uh, back in 1993 by the institutional gun lobby to let it pass. Um, and, and, uh, unfortunately that's the cornerstone for all gun control and brother Brady act is what they're using. If you didn't have that right now, guess what? Um, you'd be a lot safer. Um, and yep. we've been making that case for a long time. Well, and, and even on the, on the issue of background checks, Dudley, if I may, I mean, I've talked to, to law enforcement, um, people have been in law enforcement for decades who, who basically say that background checks give a false sense of security. It makes people feel safe. Oh, well, the bad guys aren't getting guns. But you and I, all of us know that that bad guys are going to get guns one way or another. And all the background yeah. check system does is give this feeling, oh, well, bad guys aren't getting guns. Um, and, and in reality, it's hamming up the process for law-abiding citizens to get guns to defend themselves against the crooks who don't follow the law. Yeah, and Brendan, right now, um, in these places where the right's being delayed, only the bad guys are getting guns. Yeah, so. yeah. Yeah, and that all because uh, law-abiding citizens aren't getting permits doesn't mean the bad guys aren't still getting guns. Um, I wanted to address a comment, Tucker. Um, you've been uh, commenting about Nebraska gun laws. I mean, do you think you, if you live in a Republican-controlled state and you think that your gun laws are good, you're probably wrong. Sadly, um, I mean, yeah, so, Nebraska, Texas. Yeah. Let me I mean, let me even, touch it. Even even Utah has some pretty bad laws. Yeah, they do. Yeah, and. You're talking three of the deepest red states in the country, or some yeah. of them. You know, um, Dudley and Brendan, let me talk a little bit about what's going on in South Carolina right now, a uh, deep do. red state. Um, yeah. uh, South Carolina right now does not have constitutional carry. Uh, you are not; It does not have open carry. Uh, you have to have a permit to carry concealed. And you have one of the reddest uh, counties in the, in, in the state, Saluda County, uh, which just passed three weeks ago. Uh, a resolution supporting the Second Amendment. Uh, now this crisis hits, and all of a sudden they're passing uh, emergency powers allowing for the uh, the temporary confiscation, uh, not confiscation, but um, a ban on sale of firearms and ban on transport of firearms. Uh, deep Red County, um, it's, it's acting like San Jose. 
uh, in California, which as uh, those of you who have been following the news know, uh, the, state, uh, the state of California is going after a, a gun shop in San Jose, which is defying the, the order, um, uh, the shelter in place order. Um, so um, it, it, red states can be just as bad as blue states, but I think what this really gets to is um, uh, not only do they have to, do we have to insist our elected officials rescind uh, these uh, restrictions on the Second Amendment right now, uh, but we also have to insist when this is over, uh, we go back to our state legislatures, go back to our county commissions and demand that they actually pass pro-gun uh, reforms, especially in yeah. red states where it's possible. There is no more excuses for politicians to go off and, well, uh, and, and push gun control uh, light in, uh, in times of uh, when things are better. Um, let me, they now let, me give you a, thing. let me give you a prediction. Um, when this all blows over, and, and as Ryan said, you need to go back to the state, especially in red states, go back to your state legislature and demand um, repeals and reforms. Um, my prediction is that all of those elected officials, especially the Republicans, will tell you, quotes, there's no bigger defender of the Second Amendment than me. And I'm going to tell you, that is the biggest load of crap you'll ever hear. 99% of those people will never lift a finger to do anything to get repeal gun controls. Mm -hmm. They only do things when they're forced to. And um, it's why we have a tough time passing constitutional carry in some states unless we can force it out, out of a committee, um, away from the pocket vetoes of leadership and onto the floor. In, in Kentucky was a great example. It was bottled up by leadership um, for years. The concept was and we couldn't get on the floor, but we knew if it got onto the floor, they wouldn't have any choice. And uh, we really helped build a groundswell of, of grassroots pressure, and including help from then Governor Matt Bevin, who, um, and Senator Rand Paul, and Congressman Thomas Massey, all three of whom stuck their necks out and pushed it, and that's what made it happen. Otherwise, frankly, the rhino jerks in your legislature would have stopped it. Um, that's, that is true in almost every red state in the country, unless yeah. you force it. They are going to stop it. Indiana is another one yeah. right now. Yeah, that's a, that's a great, great point, Dudley. You know, Indiana, um, Indiana. Uh, speaking of restrictions on the right to carry, overall the burden um, is, is is not terrible. You still have to have a permit to carry open or concealed. There, the permit is cheap. They just passed a lifetime permit and trying to buy off gun owners with something less than constitutional carry. But Indiana has super majorities. A Republican governor, there's no excuse for them to not be a constitutional carry state. And let me right. let me talk to real quick um, for everyone following. I just posted on the on the feed there an article talking about the Saluda County um, situation in South Carolina uh, article at gunpowdermagazine.com that I, I wrote up kind of delving into that more. But, you know, even in states that have Democrat control, you got to stay on offense and keep pushing constitutional carry here in Michigan. You know, Republicans control the House and the Senate. We have a Democrat governor. You know, Democrats should not uh, should should be feeling heat as well for their support of gun control. I mean, you know, here in Michigan, criminal justice reform is all the talk. You know, we want to make sure people aren't getting thrown in jail. Well, you know, who's forget getting forgotten about is gun owners. You know, that, that's where de uh, many Democrats just say, well, we we support criminal justice reform, but gun owners should be thrown in jail. And I want to force here in Michigan, um, you know, Democrats to defend throwing gun owners in jail for a victimless crime for five years, um, you know, and, and, and states across the country, you know, you got to stay on defense because if or you got to stay on offense, because if you're on defense, they're just going to keep taking your, your, your rights away. And this happens in Republican states, you know, in Texas. I mean, everybody wants to think that Texas is this great pro gun state. They didn't have open carry of any form until 2015. And they only did that because we started pushing constitutional carry there. They, they thought, oh, well, we'll give them some crumbs, but we aren't going away. Um, but what happens is the Republican establishment in these red states get complacent. Dudley, you saw this in Colorado where Republicans get complacent. And then next thing you know, they get wiped out at the polls because they aren't doing anything. Um, well, sometimes, uh, sometimes we're a part of wiping them out at the polls. Uh, <laughs> I, I think um, it was a reporter called our organization Professional Rhino Hunters. Um, you know, there's, there's some great comments on this. Uh, 
um, you know, Brady and said uh, Oklahoma is a constitutional carry state. Another great example, yes. Oklahoma, um, the legislators there, uh, very conservative state, um, but the, the legislators there several years ago passed a uh, essentially a permit for open carry. And which is an open carry. It's still in this situation we're all talking about here is you would have been delayed because you went through government and had to ask permission, yada, yada, yada. And it's nice to have a concealed handgun permit, but the fact is when you really need it, you don't want government in the way. And just yep. because somebody didn't prepare in advance and then all of a sudden they actually need it, you know, government shouldn't stand in their way. In fact, it should stand back and say, you know what, we're granting everybody in the state who's legally eligible to possess a firearm, you you now get to carry a firearm concealed. Um, in, in, in other words, if they want to use emergency powers, why don't they sit, why don't they use an emergency power for that? Yeah. If you absolutely. want to buy a firearm, I'm going to grant you the right to own that firearm. If you if you're a, a violent felon who'd been convicted, then and and you have it, you know what? You're still in violation of the law anyway. Yeah. Um and that's what a good that's what a good uh, governor would do right now. Unfortunately, we don't have many of those. Yeah. Um, Missouri is another great example of of a state. Uh, there was a question Steve asked, which I thought was interesting. Uh, Steve asked, if you move from one state to another uh, with your guns, are you still okay with them being registered to you? Well, the term registered is an interesting concept because most states. Um, the, the majority of states don't have registration. They have a Brady requirement, which is more like gun owner registration. Um, and, but the, the gun is not actually quotes registered, um, unless they put all kinds of requirements about no private sale. Many states, you can still sell firearms privately. Mm -hmm. You could, you could sell to your buddy for cash. And, um, as long as you know, they are not they're not ineligible to possess that firearm, you can do that. In the current state in Colorado, you can't do that. Um, the, the Dems in the legislature stop that, great. Um, but I can tell you, I've had a lot of people call me up and ask me, hey, can you lend me a firearm right now? But that would be illegal, so I don't. Yeah, Steve, I'd definitely make sure to check your the state that you're moving to and what their laws are, along with all the transportation laws in the states that you would have to travel through if you're moving. Yeah. Well, and, and there's also the difference between how a law is written and how it's actually enforced as well. You get some oddities out there where, where, you know, for example, here in Michigan, there is a de facto pistol registry, um, but it's not, it's, it's enforced as if it's a registration, but it's actual transactional database um, that the state police and other government agencies act as if it's a registry. It's a complete registry, but it's not. In fact, there's ways to exempt yourself from the registration requirements. So, you know, it, and, and this is the problem ultimately with gun control. Gun control is written um, and then it gets changed over the years and it gets layered upon layered upon layer. But I mean, looking at looking at the layer cake of gun control laws in Tennessee, uh, we were talking about the constitutional carry law there. Yeah. We're trying to pass a clean constitutional carry law the way that they were trying to write the bill that the governor came out and supported, unfortunately, uh, would have allowed you to carry without a permit if you're able to basically get an enhanced permit. That doesn't make any sense at all. But so you're you're guilty until you can prove that you can carry. That's that's not how uh, rights work in America. It's innocent until proven guilty, and the burden is on government to prove that you are guilty or that you are not legal to possess a handgun. So you know. One, one side thing about Tennessee is that, you know, uh, th unfortunately, that looked like the bad version that was that was that was gaining traction in the state. So with the Tennessee legislature kind of you know taking a break right now, they can think about how bad they, their bill was. And we're going to be communicating with legislators there and ho yeah. hopefully get them to, to clean it up so that it's it, it's if you have the right to possess, you should be able to carry it openly or concealed. No extra requirements. Straight and straight and clear. No confusion on it because. 
more people should be able to enjoy this right. It should not be confusing how to practice this right. That's right. Yeah, Brendan, I, I think with regard to, I was actually in Tennessee just before all the, the virus stuff really got bad and you know, testifying uh, in support of constitutional carry, but uh, criticizing that particular bill. I think we'll have uh, plenty of time here in the off season now to uh, uh, get back in touch with those lawmakers in Tennessee to get a real bill that, uh, passed there. It, it kind of reminds me a little bit of uh, the way Mississippi passed uh, bag carry one year uh, when they're, we were pushing constitutional carry, uh, and then a year later they had to come back and say, all right, uh, make up, oh, we should just pass constitutional carry and, and be done with it, and they did. So um, we're, we're going to be pushing on offense in, in Tennessee here uh, next year and, and throughout this year when the legislature does eventually resume. Um, yeah. uh, but another state, you um, uh, if you mind, Dudley, um, one more right. state to keep an eye on is, uh, is Pennsylvania. Uh, with all these local gun restrictions that they're talking about, we're already hearing rumors that Philadelphia is trying to you know, play games with gun shops as <clears throat> non-essential services. Um, one, one thing that we can look at in Pennsylvania is this preemption bill that they're trying to pass in their state legislature to strengthen their firearms preemption law. Um, every state should have a firearms preemption law, and, and Pennsylvania's needs to be stronger. And it's a state that Republicans dominate in the legislature. So there's no reason that that bill should be sitting in the in committee and not getting hearings. Uh, when their legislature resumes, we're going to expect Pennsylvania lawmakers to pass a strong preemption law. So none of this stuff happens um, that we're seeing in other states. Well, let me let me um, um, address one other comment since there are a couple of them here. Uh, <laughs> a both Doug and, 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 and a guy named Benjamin uh, said, um, basically question my my use of the term assault weapon um there are a lot of people in the gun movement who uh say never say the word assault weapon never say the word assault rifle there are also people who say never use the term weapon because unless you're shooting a person it's not really a weapon and look come on don't get wrapped up around the axle about that kind of stuff we all know what we're talking about when we say a semi-automatic sporting rifle but frankly that's kind of a mouthful um, and so uh, I use the term assault rifle. Um, it's certainly patterned after the M4. And I'm not going to let the, the little bedwetting liberals in America um, make me, you know, use politically correct speech. Um, you know, if, if the, the guns I own uh, in my vault are not assault weapons, I'm going to trade them back in for some that are. Um, <laughs> the, the fact is... Uh, um, we want criminals to know that armed, law-abiding Americans uh, are ready to do harm to them uh, if that's what they choose um, to commit violent acts. And um, we're an armed society is a polite society. So that's uh, why I use the term. Um, I think we're going to do this a little more often, and um, especially in this kind of time frame um, where it's so odd and so many people are at home. And um, I think we're going to try and get some other guests. Uh, I'm going to try and get some members of Congress to come on and, and use it just like a talk show, talk about what's happening around the country and what they think makes the most sense and use our contacts to connect uh, our members and supporters with what's happening. And, um, and I think we, we can have a decent conversation about a whole slew of issues and might even do some fun little stuff about, um, I'm going to do some reloading in my, in my house and, Maybe I'll uh, include members on that video. So thank you all for tuning in. Uh, we especially want to thank you who are donors. Um, we know right now is a pretty tough time. All we ask is, uh, is support us when you can, especially right now. We want you to share us everywhere um, and, and connect people who are sitting at home and or, or have to work a little bit, but they're home at night trying to figure out what's going on. Connect us. And that's, that's where you can really help right now. We thank you all and everyone stay safe. Thank you. Thank you everyone. Thank you, Dudley.